Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about health care topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenter is Dr. Harpreet Dillon. Dr. Dillon is an internal medicine physician with the Washington Township Medical Foundation. Hi, good evening and welcome. I'm so glad to be here to talk to you about one, one of the two subjects that are really near and dear to my heart. I've been sort of involved with treating high blood pressure and cholesterol all my adult years since I became an, became an MD and I'd really studied at the mecca of heart disease in, the, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, affiliate of the Cle Cleveland Clinic Foundation. So our focus tonight is going to be on hypertension as well as high cholesterol, but we'll get to the cholesterol side after we discuss the high blood pressure. So the definition of hypertension is a persistent elevation of systolic blood pressure greater than the top number being 140, which is known as the systolic blood pressure, and the bottom number being 90, which is known as the diastolic blood, blood pressure. Historically, we've always used these two numbers as a borderline status for people that have high blood pressure. So if, if you heard 140 over 90, you know, in the past you were borderline, but going forward, that has changed, which we'll discuss in a minute. It's, the guidelines have become a little bit stricter because we're finding out that control of blood pressure is so important to almost all the cardiovascular diseases like diabetes, hypertension, diabetes, stroke, heart disease, peripheral artery disease, known as bad circulation. So worldwide estimated one billion people have high blood pressure. One in three Americans are affected by high blood pressure as well. So just to take a survey in this room, how many of you have high blood pressure? So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven out of nine. So that's more than 33% or one in third. So this is all, you know, so this is very prevalent. It's very common and people just don't understand how important it is to recognize and treat high blood pressure. So we used to, we used to call anything over 120 over 80, which is really normal. And we used to call it prehypertension. Anything above 120 or over 180, but less than 140 over 90. And that used to be known as prehypertension in the past. Factors that influence blood pressure equal are cardiac output, the force that your heart puts out, plus the systemic vascular resistance, meaning what is the resistance in the arteries and the circulation that your heart has to pump against. The heart is essentially a pump and has to pump against resistance in the circulation system. The factors influencing your blood pressure again are cardiac, heart rate, inotropic states, neural, hormonal. So yeah, remember I told you that in the past we noted that anything above 120, between 120 and 140 was prehypertension. Well, there's no such thing as prehypertension anymore. We're getting much stricter on you guys, okay? So either you have high blood pressure or you don't. And if you have high blood, blood pressure, it's called high blood pressure. And if you have borderline blood pressure, it's called elevated blood pressure, all right? So again, so, so now the new definition of high blood pressure, I, I told you we're getting stricter. Now it's 130 over 80, okay? All the clinical trials have shown that people have much better outcomes when they can control their blood pressure to 130 over 80. That's especially true of diabetes, especially true of strokes, especially true of heart disease. And again, it's the number one risk factor in deaths globally, worldwide. Number one reason people have higher death rates than any, than any other reason is high blood pressure. So this is the categories of the blood pressure in adults. So that's, that, as I said, normal is 120 over 80. Elevated blood pressure, which is now the new pre-hypertension group, right? That's between 120 to 128 only. I don't care what the bottom number is. The bottom number will not define it, only the top number. If you're above 120 and you're below 130, you have elevated blood pressure, previously known as prehypertension. 
Now, look at this slide, very important slide, very powerful slide. So basically what this tells you is you double your risk for every 20 millimeters mercury that you go up on the top number, you double your risk for heart attacks and cardiovascular mortality, all right? So if you go from 115 to 135, you have two times the risk. 135 to 155 goes four times. So it's exponential, it's not linear, it's exponential. And again, the good news is, however, if you can control your blood pressure, you can decrease your risk of having cardiovascular heart attacks and strokes by almost up to 50% when it comes to your heart and 40% when it comes to strokes, okay? So you, can, there, so you can decrease your risk by controlling your blood pressure. That's a very powerful thing. So here you, here you have a guy, so this is a typical, guy, typical kind of guy who's gonna have high blood pressure, right? This is a good old Texan boy, right? Age over 50. He loves to drink, loves to have his little nightly toddy, and he likes to smoke his cigars, right? And he probably has, he's overweight, so he has diabetes, and he has elevated cholesterol, right? And he loves to sprinkle salt on his ribs, right? So he's got, so he's got elevated blood pressure from, ele from sodium intake, right? And his gender is a male, okay? So those are the common modifiable risk factors. We can actually do something about these risk factors. We can't do anything about his age. We can't do anything about his family history of high blood pressure, but we can do something about lipids, <coughs> his cigarettes, his alcohol, and his excessive salt intake in his foods. So again, these are the ones that you cannot modify, okay? The family history and the ethnicity. However, the obesity, the sedentary lifestyle, and the stress are manageable to a certain degree. And if you can manage those, your, your risk for having high blood pressure goes down. All right, so we know we call it the silent killer. Why do we call it the silent killer? Does anybody know? You don't know what you've got. That's exactly right. You don't know whether you have high blood pressure unless you measure it. Mm -hmm. So people can go on feeling great, and it's not going to give you any symptoms and you don't know you have it, commonly, most people have it for about five years, five to 10 years before they even diagnose it on a routine office visit, all right? So 10 is a, 10 is a little extreme, but five years very commonly. People have had high blood pressure before they were diagnosed with it. And again, there's two classes of hypertension, why we get hypertension, we call them etiology. Why does it happen, etiology? The first one is primary, which is essential or idiopathic. We don't know. 95% of the time, we don't know why people have high blood pressure. It could be due to their ethnicity, could be due to their lifestyle, could be due to some other factor, but 95% of the time, it's unknown etiology. 5% of the time, we do know why it is, okay? It's because they either have salt-retaining hormones and vasoconstrictors, or they have diabetes, or they're overweight, or they have elevated sodium intake, or they drink alcohol, okay? And so what are the organs or the parts of the body that are affected by high blood pressure? Well, think about it. High blood pressure travels in arteries, and arteries go to all different organs, but the ones that are most important, the ones that are affected are the heart, the brain, the peripheral vasculature, that is the circulation in your arms and legs, your kidneys, and your eyes. So sometimes you can go to an optometrist and your, your friendly neighborhood optometrist will call me and he'll say, hey, you know, Mr. Mr. So-and-so, I noticed that he has high blood pressure. Are you treating him for it? And I'm like, I haven't seen him in five years. <laughs> you know, and that's because they can see it in your eye. And that's when. So this is an example of a heart that's diseased, on the, uh, the top one anyhow. So the top one, what do you notice? Well, you notice a very small cavity, right? The, the bottom one, you notice a much larger cavity. So the bottom one is a healthy heart, the top one is a diseased heart, and the reason it's diseased is that over time it had to pump so hard that it grew in muscle, and it basically shut off its own blood supply because it got so big, it just, it just shut off its own circulation and, had heart, and that's when you have heart attacks, when the, when the blood supply to the heart doesn't meet the demand, okay? Because the heart has to pump so hard because it's such a big muscle now, okay. 
All right, so again, blood pressure variability is common, as you mentioned, in the morning, you know, it's gonna be higher. Between 4 to 6 p.m., it's gonna be higher. That's the diurnal variation or the circadian rhythm. And then, we, and I just talked about this, white coat or masked hypertension. White coat hypertension is when you go to the doctor's office and you're sitting there and you're anxious and you're gonna have high blood pressure, okay? And, but when you go home or you go check it at the drugstore, it's gonna be lower. That's called white coat hypertension. All right, so we're gonna focus on accurate measurements. How? We're gonna make sure that instruments are properly calibrated. We're gonna avoid smoking caffeine or exercise within 30 minutes before measurements. We're gonna empty our bladder, okay? It's very important. When you empty your bladder, you naturally decrease the amount of salt and water in your body, all right? And that's gonna decrease or maintain your normal resting blood pressure. We're gonna make sure we're seated. We'll make sure that when we, they measure our blood pressure, it's not in our dominant arm. Our dominant arm is always going to have a higher blood pressure than our non-dominant arm, okay? So you wanna measure in the non-dominant arm and make sure it's at heart level. Make sure it's the correct cuff size. If, if the MA is measuring your blood pressure and it's tight and it hurts, it's because why? The cuff is too small for your arm, okay? And you're going to get an elevated blood pressure reading and, and that's inaccurate. So you wanna make sure that it's nice and comfortable, it's not hurting you when to check your blood pressure. All right, so we talked about sustained mass and white coat hypertension. Mass hypertension is in the office or the clinical setting. You don't have high blood pressure, but then you go home and you have it. That means either they didn't, they didn't take it properly or the cuff was too large, okay? It was too large and your, and your arms are too skinny, so it didn't, it didn't record the blood pressure and that's called mass hypertension. Okay, so in general, treatment is similar for all demographic and ethnic groups. By that we mean, you know, ethnic groups, we mean African Americans, Mexicans, Native Americans, Caucasians, and, and uh, Asians. But the prevalence and severity of hypertension is increased in African Americans, as well as Mexicans and Native Americans. Now there's a subset of patients in where we like to treat hypertension differently, and this is hypertension in the older patient. Because often what, ta what, what will happen is that we'll put them on blood pressure medication and what's gonna happen is their blood pressure will drop. And it's gonna drop so severely that they're gonna get dizzy and lightheaded. Mm -hmm. So we're very careful in the people over the 70 year old age group who have hy hypertension and we would normally give them half the dose of, the, of a normal blood pressure medication because of their inability to sustain their blood pressure when they stand up. Okay, because they've lost that baroreceptor reflex or the natural ability of the body to maintain that blood pressure going up to your brain. So we mentioned a little bit about isolated systolic hypertension, which is what we would normally see in the elderly. Okay, now this is a, um, this is a slide that I, that I sort of put up there because most of my patients, they come to me and they say, well, you know, my surgeon wants to replace my knee and he wants, me, he wants to know whether I should take his blood pressure medication that other medications are not. And so basically the idea there is that if it's an elective surgery, you wanna make sure your blood pressure is controlled, all right? You'll have better outcomes when you have a normal blood pressure for an elective. Now if it's an emergency surgery, it's an emergency, you know. We'll manage your blood pressure interoperatively if we have to, but in order to get better outcomes, before you go under the knife or before you have, go into anesthesia, make sure that you get a medical clearance from your PCP, your primary care physician, and if he thinks that your blood pressure is normal and stable, then he'll give you the okay to have the surgery. If, if you don't, if it's not normal or if it's elevated, it's better to control your blood pressure first than to go into surgery. Now, the other thing about this, this slide is that say, well, should I start taking medications during surgery? And the answer is no. You never wanna take medications during surgery unless it's administered by the anesthesiologist to control your intraoperative blood pressure, okay? So again, what are things that we can do outside of our doctor's help and our, our friendly pharmaceutical drug help as far as, you know, how can we reduce our blood pressure? Well, if you just have a five to 10 kilogram loss of your weight, you can decrease your systolic blood pressure, the top number, 
by almost 20 millimeters mercury. And remember what that means, that number 20 millimeters mercury, you've just decreased your risk of having a heart attack or stroke by twofold, right? Because I mentioned that every 20 millimeters mercury, that top number goes up, your risk doubles. So just by losing five to 10 kilograms, you can decrease your risk of having any type of a serious illness. And what is known as the DASH diet, okay? You might have heard about this DASH diet, okay? Um, on TV late at night or something like that. And that's literally, it's an acronym for dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And the main one there is sodium reduction or salt reduction. You want to make sure that you eat less than two grams of salt a day. That's sort of the magic number, two grams, okay? So about half to a teaspoon is about two grams of salt. And if you're drinking, obviously it's not a good idea to drink, but if you are drinking, you like to have your beer or wine at night, you want to decrease it, decrease it by 50%. And you know, that'll really help your blood pressure stay down as well. We talked a little about this already, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, what's a modifiable, modifiable risk factor versus a fixed risk factor? And uh, so I think I already told you that cigarette smoking and diabetes and cholesterol and all those are modifiable, and, and the other, the gender, the ethnicity is not. So what, so what can we do in addition to diet? Well, we can do exercise. And by physical activity, we're talking about aerobic activity at least 30 minutes most days of the week. That's five days, folks. Five days, 30 minutes equals 150 minutes a week of aerobic exercise. And by aerobic exercise, we mean getting to max 80% of your maximal heart rate. Well, then you might ask me, well, Doc, what's your maximal heart rate? Well, it's 220 minus your age, OK? So if you're 80 years old, it's 220 minus 80, which is, I think, 140. And you want to get to 80% of that. So you want to get your heart rate up to, I think, I don't know, 116, 116 or 118, something like that. <coughs> you want to get up to 80% of your maximal heart rate to get into your aerobic zone. This is your fat burning zone. This is where you're going to burn the greatest amount of calories. OK? So I don't care what you do, whether it's bike or walk or play with your grandson or do housework. You do it. You have to do it at a pace that meets 80% 80, 80 of your maximal heart rate. So we talked a little bit about the weight reduction, we talked about the DASH diet, and we talked about exercise. And the idea here is basically they all add up, okay? So weight loss, you can lower it by five millimeters of mercury just by losing 5% 5, 5 of your body weight, okay? Diet, you know, there's another 11, 11 millimeters of mercury by just avoiding salt, okay? So that's 16. And exercise, three to four. So right there, without any kind of medication, if you just do those three things, weight loss, avoid salt, and exercise, you can decrease your blood pressure by 15 to 20 millimeters mercury. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about drug therapy and how does drug therapy really help us? Well, primarily what drug therapy does, all these blood pressure medications, is they decrease your resistance, all right? So think of it as a lead pipe, right? Like you have a lead pipe, well, when the pipe's not clogged, then you have low resistance. And water or blood can move through the pipe freely, okay, without very little effort. And the heart doesn't have to work that hard, right? Now, let's say there's a lot of, you know, clogged up material and gunk in that lead pipe, which is known as atherosclerosis, right, cholesterol plaques. Now the blood has to be pushed harder through that pipe by your heart. And every time, the, and, and when there's resistance in that artery, or that lead pipe, that's going to increase your blood pressure that's going to be required to get that blood to go through. So in, that, and so in that sense, what these blood pressure medications do is they decrease that resistance. You know, they help the arteries relax, arteries expand, or there are certain types of chemicals that these, that these drugs have in them that help relax the musculature of these arterioles that decrease the vascular resistance and thereby decreasing the blood pressure. So what are the classifications of the drugs? Well, they're diuretics. What do diuretics do? They decrease the salt, they decrease the water in your body, okay? So they decrease the, vas the, the effective uh, volume. Adrenergic inhibitors, okay? So these are the drugs that help control sort of that hormonal, stress hormonal response where, where things tend to clamp down, you know? 
arteries tend to clamp down when they're stressed and, and, the, and, during, this, and during the stuff in the morning, seven to nine and, and four to six, you know, there's a higher SVR resting state in the body and those, those particular m medications help do that. Direct vasodilators, they help relax the, the arteries of the, relax the smooth muscle of the arteries or their vasodilators, okay? Angiotensin inhibitors, so these are, the, these are the drugs that help the kidneys. So the kidney is the, is, the, is the organ that controls and regulates the blood pressure in your body, all right? So the angiotensin inhibitors help, help the kidney do that, regulate your blood pressure. And calcium channel blockers, similarly, they uh, work on smooth muscle in the arterial cell walls to help relax this. So just to mention very quickly on that slide, we've actually simplified everything to either normal blood pressure or stage one hypertension or stage two hypertension, all right? So somebody who has stage one hypertension, meaning they're above 130 over 80, right? Because 130 over 80 is elevated systolic blood pressure and 120 over 80 is normal, right? So stage one hypertension, your chance of having a heart attack or a stroke in 10 years is 10%, just by having stage one hypertension alone, no other factors considered. Okay, stage two hypertension, you have to become a little bit more aggressive. So if I'm trying to tr treat somebody who's like now 140 over 90, because now that's stage two hypertension in the new classification system, I have to be more aggressive with that person, and I'm gonna start them with two blood pressure medications. Not one, but two. Stage one hypertension, I can still treat you with one blood pressure medication, as well as lifestyle changes and all the other things we talked about. All right, so what are some nice things that you can eat <laughs> to help your blood pressure, right? Okay. Okay, so these, the so first one that's my favorite is called coca. Okay, so coca is a flavonoid. It's found in coca. It has been shown to increase the formation of endothelial nitric oxide. That's, that's the, the element or the chemical that helps relax vasculature, nitric oxide. And coca has a lot of that, okay, when you cook with it and whatnot. Not a, well, a cup of cocoa is better than a cup of hot chocolate. Because what do you like to do with hot chocolate? Put sugar in it, right? Cocoa has a natural bitter sweetness. A little kind of tiny give it dark chocolate will have the same effect as cocoa, right? Yeah. Or cocoa powder, you can put that in your ice cream or whatever it is that you like to eat. But the idea is you don't, you don't want to you know, cook it or put other things in it like sugar and milk and all this other stuff because it need, needs to be eaten naturally because that's where the benefit is. It's a, it, it's, it's, it's a flavonoid, it's natural. Okay, the next, thing, the next great thing that you can take for your blood pressure in your heart is fish oil, right? So fish oil is a good source of omega-3 fatty acids, which are an antioxidant. Now, we talked about, you said anti-inflammatory. This is an antioxidant, okay? So antioxidants work with a, a different framework. They decrease the inflammation in your body okay, in the, arch, in the arteries, in your heart, and all the circulations, decreases the inflammation, which is very, very beneficial. So, how do you know you're getting good fish oil? Well, you can go to Costco or Walgreens, and you can pick something off the shelf, right? And you don't necessarily know what you're getting, because it's not FDA regulated. Uh, sorry, it's not FDA approved, but it is FDA regulated. So you want to make sure that whatever fish oil you buy, it has good processes, you know, good f factory processes in the way that they make it, and the FDA will put a seal of that. They'll say <coughs> FDA approved. Mm -hmm. Not FDA regulated, because only drugs and pharmaceuticals are FDA regulated, but it'll say F seal of approval by the FDA for manufacturing processes. You want to look mm -hmm. for that, okay? And there's two types of fish oil. There's, a, there's the EPA and the DHA, okay? They're the two, two, two different types of fish oil in these things. And when you add them up, you want to make sure that you're taking at least three grams of EPA and DHA, or just, just a fish oil for, 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 for argument's sake. You want, to, you want to eat at least three grams a day, okay? So whatever fish oil you get, make sure you're taking three grams to get the full benefit. And also make sure that the fish oil is coming from a reputable fish, okay? What about krill? Krill is a great one, okay? Salmon also. 
Salmon is a good one as well, but you want to stay away from catfish and, and some of these uh, bottom feeders, right? Mm -hmm. Catfish and some of these trouts or flounders or something like that. They're bottom feeders. You know, you want active fish. You want fish that flurries around like krill and everything else. Mm -hmm. You know, because they're always, they're always moving. They're always, they're always, they're not bottom Ooh. feeders. <laughs> so you want to make sure that it's from, you know, cr krill or small fish or, or even sardines, you know, they, they're a good source of omega-3s as well. Okay, so magnesium. A lot of people don't know about this element. It's, it's a natural vitamin. So the treatment of hypertension is intimately related to calcium metabolism. So in order for calcium to get into, get into the cells, it needs magnesium, okay? So if you don't have, if you don't have magnesium, you're, the calcium metabolism is, is, is off. So it's thought to be a natural calcium channel blocker, just like the blood pressure medication calcium channel blocker, like amylodipine. Mm -hmm. Well, magnesium blocks that calcium channel as well. Okay, so it helps relax. In fact, oftentimes in the hospital, if somebody has heart instability or something like that, oftentimes we'll check the magnesium first to find out why the heart is irritable. Okay, and if it's low, then we're able to give a magnesium infusion that helps stabilize the heart muscle. And again, we talked about the DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. In general, the fresher the food, the more colorful, the more green and yellow it looks, the less overprocessed and overcooked is what you want to be eating, you know, as a general rule of thumb. The second part of our, our talk is about cholesterol, and I will try to speed this up because a lot of this is very similar to high blood pressure. Okay. So again, abnormal levels of cholesterol, and we and there's you know different types of cholesterol. And we'll get to that. One is known as LDL, which is a good cholesterol. The other was known as HDL. I'm sorry, LDL is a bad cholesterol. HDL is a good cholesterol, and that's what we target when we're trying to do a cholesterol therapy. Next slide. Okay, so again, cholesterol is a waxy-like substance. It's made in the liver and other cells. It's also found in certain foods, such as dairy products, eggs, and meat. Your body needs cholesterol to function properly. Our cell walls are also known as membranes, need cholesterol to produce hormones, vitamin D, and bile, bile acids that help you digest fat. But it only needs a limited amount of cholesterol. When there's too much, health problems such as heart disease occur. Here is the chemical diagram of a cholesterol molecule, right? Think of hundreds and thousands and millions of these making cell walls all over your body, which is necessary, but too much of it, again, leads to cholesterol plaques. So what are the types of cholesterol? Well, we know there's what we call the LDL, which is a bad cholesterol because it can cause plaque buildup in the walls of arteries. And the more LDL there is in the blood, the greater risk of heart disease, okay? We're talking about clogging the arteries, clogging that lead pipe again, okay? From cholesterol plaques will cause cardiovascular disease. High density lipoproteins, these are the bigger molecules, okay? They're known as a good cholesterol. Helps the body get rid of LDL, so it'll actually help decrease your bad cholesterol. Maintaining a high level of HDL is good if your HDL level level is lowering your risk of heart disease goes up. So again, if your heart disease or other factors is causing it to get worse, you want to make sure you try to increase your HDL levels to diminish the risk. Very low density lipoprotein VLDL are similar to LDLs in that it contains mostly fat and not much protein. So VLDL and, HD and LDL are big molecules, okay, and, the, and they're bad, and the, and the HDL is the good molecule. Triglycerides and other type of fats are carried in the blood by VLDL. So again, excess calories, alcohol, and sugar are converted into triglycerides and stored as fat. So this is a really important thing to understand. I don't think many people do, and they don't, they don't understand why they're gaining weight. I don't eat, hey doc, I gained 15 pounds, but I don't, I'm a vegetarian. I just, I don't, I don't eat meat, and you know, I don't eat steak. And I'm like, well, what else do you, well, I love to eat rice, I love to eat bread, I love to eat, you know, Indian naan and everything else that's a carbohydrate. Well, guess what happens to all the excess carbohydrate that your liver cannot store, right? 
it goes into what are called triglycerides. It makes triglycerides, which is fat. And that's when people gain weight, they get central adiposity, they get metabolic syndrome, and they get into all kinds of problems, okay? So again, the diseases that are linked to hypercholesterolemia are heart attacks, strokes, peripheral vascular disease, same one as high blood pressure. Again, coronary heart disease is the number one sort of risk factor that, that occurs or formulates when you have high cholesterol, all right, heart disease. Clogging of the heart arteries itself. We're, not, we're talking not, not about the big arteries, we're talking about the little arteries in the heart and the brain and the kidneys. They're the ones that get affected most primarily with high cholesterol. Diabetes also can upset the balance between your good cholesterol and your bad cholesterol. It causes your bad cholesterol to go up, your good cholesterol to come down, and that causes plaques to build up in the blood vessels. Sugar attaches to lipoprotein, so it likes to piggy tail the cholesterol protein molecule, okay? And again, all of these types of things that build up plaque in the arteries cause what? Increase the stomach vascular resistance, the resistance goes up, so now blood pressure goes up. Now, how do you diagnose high cholesterol? All right, well, first of all, everybody over the age of 30, or they say 20, but should get their cholesterol levels measured at least once every five years. I start at age 25 if they have a family history of cholesterol. So high cholesterol does not cause symptoms, so many people aren't aware that their cholesterol levels are too high. Same as blood pressure, this is the second natural killer. People don't know they have high cholesterol until they go for a physical at their doctor's office and they actually do a lipid panel. And again, these are the risks that we talked about, the clogging of the arteries and all the different risk factors, very similar to high blood pressure that causes high cholesterol. Know your numbers, this is a great slide. Okay, total cholesterol, just remember 200, all right? You don't wanna be, when, when you look at that lipid panel and it says total cholesterol, you wanna stay under 200. Low LDL or the bad cholesterol, you wanna stay below 160 if you have any risk factors like high blood pressure or diabetes, you wanna be less than 160, uh, sorry, high blood pressure, not diabetes, diabetes is, 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 is different. So desirable is anything less than 130, okay? Borderline is 160, all right? But just 130, that should be your target for your LDL. Now if you're diabetic, it's much more severe than that. It's actually 100, and some cardiologists will say it's 70. It's humanly impossible to get your LDL to get down to 70 unless you're taking medications. I haven't seen it yet. I think there was one woman who had an LDL of like 80, 81, and she wasn't on anything. But diabetics, people who have strokes, you wanna get your LDL under 100, otherwise you're at high risk. So very strict for those subgroups of patients. HDLs, generally speaking, above 35. All right, you wanna to try to get your HDL levels, whether it's exercise or a glass of red wine once a week, or you're taking omega-3 fatty acids or supplements or nitric oxide, you wanna make sure your HDL is above at least 35, but for women, they naturally have, they have a tendency to have higher HDLs anyways. So most women will outpace men in terms of their level of HDLs. Women will have a higher HDL production than men. And your triglycerides, you wanna be 150 or less. All right, so those are the greasy, greasy fried foods types of cholesterol that you're getting, right? The triglycerides, as well as from all the excess carbohydrate and fat storage. You wanna be less than 150. So remember, 200 for cholesterol, 130 for LDL, 35 for HDL, and 150 for triglycerides. So similarly to blood pressure, what are some of the things that we can do ourselves to treat our cholesterol? Well, you can eat more beans, legumes, seeds, and nuts. Your weekly target should be four servings of nuts, seeds, or legumes, such as black beans, garbanzos, or lentils, okay? How much is enough nuts? Enough nuts that you can make a fistful of. Yeah, whatever that is. Just go into a bag, and if you can grab enough nuts in your fist, well, that's enough. All right? You don't even need to eat more than that. Again, eat more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. The fiber in these foods helps lower LDL cholesterol. Again, celery, you know, it's high fiber. It'll lower your LDL because it'll block the absorption of cholesterol in your gut. 
So celebrate each pound you lose. Dropping even five or 10 pounds can dramatically decrease your risk of heart attacks and stroke and decrease your cholesterol. And feed your body regularly. When you skip a meal, you're more likely to overeat later. Five to six mini meals work best. Now that's important because what does a state of fasting do? Slows everything down. The body's like, gosh, I don't know when I'm going to get fed again. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to conserve. I'm not going to. I'm not going to burn calories because I don't know if I'm going to need them or not. Okay. So the first meal after an eight-hour fast does what? It goes straight into fat storage. Okay. So people say, oh, I'm going to lose weight because I'm not going to eat all day. But then I'll have a great big meal at night and I'll be satisfied and I'll go to bed. Well, these people tend to gain weight. They don't lose weight, they gain weight. So first thing in the morning, within an hour, hour and a half of waking up, you've got to eat because you've got to get that metabolism going. Because if you don't eat, you're not going to get that metabolism going. All right? And I mean, they say five to six small meals, but sometimes that can work the opposite way. You can always develop hunger. So just, you know, experiment with your body. Find out what works best for you. For some people, it's just three meals a day. For some people, it is five to six. But again, you've got to keep that machinery rolling by giving it nutrients. All right, so again, we talked a little bit about diet. Now I'm going to talk about the new cholesterol diet. All right, these are plant sterols and stanols. Okay, they don't, this is nothing scientific. This is just plant based food. All right. Plant sterols and stenols are substances that occur naturally in grains, vegetables, fruits, legumes, and nuts like we talked about. Since they have powerful cholesterol-lowering properties, manufacturers have started adding them to foods. Now you get stenols and sterols in margarine spreads, orange juice, cereals, and even granola bars. So when next time you go and you buy your favorite margarine, it'll probably say fortified with stenols, okay? Because again, that decreases the amount of bad cholesterol. And how do they help? By just preventing the absorption, all right? On a molecular level, they look a lot like cholesterol, so when they travel through your digestive tract, they get in the way. They block the actual cholesterol from getting in because they suck up those receptors and clog them so the, so the natural cholesterol can't get into your body. And this is sort of a great pictogram of which foods have plants and sterols. It's, they're in cooking oil, salad dressings, milk, yogurt, snack bars, juices, and you can just see here <coughs> all the different types of foods. Even red wine, right? Red wine has resveratrol, which is, a ver uh, which is a grape extract, and so that also helps decrease your LDL, increases your HDL. So that's why people say it's great to have a glass of red wine once a week. So nuts, a great source of protein and fiber. They're healthy monounsaturated fats. They're natural antioxidants, and they have powerful cholesterol-lowering effects. Almonds are, are one of them. Cashews, walnuts, you know, a handful of nuts a day will, will keep the doctor away, not an apple. <laughs> yeah, so again, you just get an assortment of nuts, put them in your hand, and, and, and take those as natural. Again, we talked a little bit about, we already talked about omega-3 fatty acids as a natural source in fish. and and other vegetables. Again, the fattier the fish, like salmon, the better it is, the more natural omega-3 fatty acids in, in the skin it, itself, yes. Other fishes, salmon, tuna, trout, herring, sardines, and mackerel. Right, again, you wanna get three grams of EPA and DHA. So now, the new low cholesterol diet, we talked about the stenols and the sterols in plants. Now the other one is oatmeal and oat bran. Again, high sources of fiber, will decrease your cholesterol by, by blocking absorption. But yeah, you know, it's that sort of a fine balance. If you're a diabetic, no, it's not for you. All right, we'll, 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 we'll stick with the sterols and the stenols. However, if you're not a diabetic, this is a great source of dietary fiber. And it's, now we're talking about, well, what else? I've done everything I can. I still can't get my LDL down to you know, 130 or 100. Can you put me on medication? Well, of course we can. We, you know, we're doctors, right? <laughs> That's what we do. We put people on medications. We try not to, but sometimes we have to. So, so you've heard of the statins, right? The Zocor, the Crestor, the Simvastatin. These are the statin medications. They're the most powerful for lowering your LDL. You've, 
you've heard of the fibrates, the lopid, the gemfibrozil. These are the fibric acid derivatives, and these are the ones that'll decrease your triglycerides, and it'll increase your HDL, and it'll lower your LDL. The niacin, these are the natural ones that oftentimes will get, well, doctors will prescribe them to increase your HDL and to lower your triglycerides, but sometimes people have a hard time taking it because they get a flushing effect, okay? They get anxiety, or they get headaches, or they get flushing, but oftentimes that can be mitigated by taking a small baby aspirin 20 minutes or 30 minutes before you take niacin. We don't normally use niacin as a first line. First line, we either go to a statin or a fibrate. Cholesterol absorption inhibitors, we don't use those much anymore because they cause a lot of bad side effects like you know, flatulence and diarrhea and stomach bloating because their mechanism of action is to block the cholesterol from absorption. So eventually everything has to get out through the intestines. That just causes a lot of diarrhea and bloating. And again, bile acid sequestrants, and again, the natural omega-3 fatty acids that we talked about in previous slides. So one of the common things that we see with statins are side effects. It's not, not commonly, sorry, but the most common side effect that we see in statins is muscle pain, myositis. So some, if you wake up after taking months and months of statins, or even years of statins, it doesn't matter how long you can take it, you can still get uh, myositis. But the longer you take it and the higher amounts that you take, are you're going to have more of a chance to get, to get myositis. But this is basically muscle pain and weakness in your girdles shoulder girdle, and legs. Back pain, that's not a statin side effect. It's weakness and pain and tenderness to touch of the muscles in your girdles, shoulder, and hips, and thighs. There are more serious side effects of statins called rhabdomyolysis, but by that time, you're too sick and you're already admitted in the hospital. And this is an alternative to statin, it's called Zetia, okay? It reduces the amount of cholesterol and other sterols that your body absorbs from your diet. Again, so this is a medication for people who cannot tolerate statins, either from, they have a side effect of myalgias or myositis, but it's not as powerful as a statin, but it can still help lower your LDL. It doesn't have much effect on your HDL, but can help lower your total cholesterol. So I wanna thank you for being patient and allowing me to present the entirety of the slide deck. I hope you guys really got your questions answered. Learned some new information here today, hopefully to help, help yourselves.